How to Appreciate Music by Gustav Kobbe Chapter 16 Opera and Music Drama Opera originated in Florence toward the close of the 16th century. A band of enthusiastic intellectual composers aimed at reproducing the musical declamation which they believed to have been characteristic of the representation of Greek tragedy. The first attempt resulted in a cantata, Il Conte Ugolino, for single voice with the accompaniment of a single instrument and composed by Vincenzo Galileo, father of the famous astronomer. Another composer, Giulio Caccini, wrote several shorter pieces in similar style. These composers aimed at an exact oratorical rendering of the words. Consequently, their scores were neither fugal nor in any other sense polyphonic, but strictly monodic. They were not, however, melodious, but declamatory, and if Richard Wagner had wished, in the 19th century, to claim any historical foundation for the declamatory recitative which he introduced in his music dramas, he might have fallen back upon these composers of the late 16th and early 17th centuries, and through them back to Greek tragedy with its bands of lyres and flutes. These Italian composers, then, were the creators of recitative, so different from the polyphonic church music of the school of Palestrina. What usually is classed as the first opera, Jacopo Peri's Daphne, was privately performed at the Palazzo Corsi, Florence, in 1597. So great was its success that Peri was commissioned in 1600 to write a similar work for the festivities incidental to the marriage of Henry IV of France with Maria di Medici and produced Eurydice, the first Italian opera ever performed in public. The new art form received great stimulus from Claudio Monteverde, the Duke of Mantua's Maestro di Capella, who composed Ariana in honor of the marriage of Francesco Gonzaga with Margherita, Infanta of Savoy. The scene in which Ariadne bewails her desertion by her lover was so dramatically written from the standpoint of the day, of course, that it produced a sensation. And when Monteverde brought out with even greater success his opera Orfeo, which showed a great advance in dramatic expression, as well as in the treatment of the instrumental score, the permanency of opera was assured. Monteverde's scores contained, besides recitative, suggestions of melody, but these suggestions occurred only in the instrumental ritornelles. The Venetian composer Cavalli, however, introduced melody into the vocal score in order to relieve the monotonous effect of continuous recitative, and in his airs for voice, he foreshadowed the aria form, which was destined to be freely developed by Alessandro Scarlatti, who is regarded as the founder of modern Italian opera in the form in which it flourished from his day to and including the earlier period of Verdi's activity. Melody, free and beautiful melody, soaring above a comparatively simple accompaniment, was the characteristic of Italian opera from Scarlatti's first opera, L'Onesta nell'Amore, produced in Rome in 1680, to Verdi's Trovatore, produced in the same city in 1853. The names, besides Verdi's, associated with its most brilliant successes are Rossini, Il Babiere di Siviglia, Guillaume Tell, Bellini, Norma, La Sonambula, I Puritani, and Donizetti, Lucia, L'Elysion d'Amore, La Fille du Régiment. These composers possessed dramatic verve to a great degree, aimed straight for the mark, and when at their best, always hit the operatic target in the bullseye. Reforms by Gluck The charge most frequently laid against Italian opera is that its composers have been too subservient to the singers and have sacrificed dramatic truth and depth of expression as well as the musicianship which is required of a well-written and well-balanced score as between the vocal and instrumental portions to the vanity of those upon the stage. In brief, 
that Italian opera consists too much of showpieces for its interpreters. Among the first to protest practically against this abuse was Gluck, a German who, from copying the Italian style of operatic composition early in his career, changed his entire method as late as 1762, when he was nearly 50 years old. Orfeo et Euridice, the oldest opera that today still holds a place in the operatic repertoire and containing the favorite air, Ce farò senza Euridice, I have lost my Euridice, was produced by Gluck in Vienna in the year mentioned. There, Gluck followed it up with Alceste, then went to Paris and scored a triumph with Iphigenie and Aulite. But on the arrival in Paris of the Italian composer Piccini, the Italian party there seized upon him as a champion to pit against Gluck, and there then ensued in the French capital a rivalry so fierce that it became a veritable musical war of the roses, until Gluck completely triumphed over Piccini with Iphigenie and Tauride. Gluck's reform of opera lay in his abandoning all effort at claptrap effect, effect merely for its own sake, and in making his choruses, as well as his soloists, participants, musically and actively, in the unfolding of the dramatic story. But while he avoided senseless vocal embellishments and ceased to make a display of singer's talents the end and purpose of opera, he never hesitated to introduce beautiful melody for the voice when the action justified it. In fact, what he aimed at was dramatic truth in his music, and with this end in view, he also gave greater importance to the instrumental portion of his score. Comparative popularity of certain operas. These characteristics remain for many years to come the distinguishing marks of German opera. They will be discovered in Mozart's Nozze di Figaro, Don Giovanni, and Zauberflöte, which differ from Gluck's operas in not being based on heroic or classical subjects, and in exhibiting the general advance made in freer musical expression, as well as Mozart's greater spontaneity of melodic invention, his keen sense of the dramatic element, and his superior skill in orchestration. They also will be discovered in Beethoven's Fidelio, which again differs from Mozart's operas in the same degree in which the individuality of one great composer differs from that of another. With Weber's Freischütz, Juriante and Oberon, German opera enters upon the Romantic period, from which it is but a step to The Flying Dutchman, Tannhäuser, Lohengrin and the music dramas of Richard Wagner. Meanwhile, the French had developed a style of opera of their own, which is represented by Meyerbeer's Les Huguenots, Gounod's Faust, apparently destined to live as long as any opera that now graces the stage, and by Bizet's absolutely unique Carmen. In French opera, the instrumental support of the voices is far richer and more delicately discriminating than in Italian opera, and the whole form is more serious. It is better thought out, shows greater intellectual effort, and not such a complete abandon to absolute musical inspiration. It is true there is much claptrap in Meyerbeer, but Les Huguenots still lives, and vitality is, after all, the final test of an artwork. Unquestionably, Italian operas like Il Babiere di Siviglia, La Sonambula, Lucia, and Trovatore are more popular in this country than Mozart's or Weber's operatic works. In assigning reasons for this, it seems generally to be forgotten that these Italian operas are far more modern. Don Giovanni was produced in 1787, whereas Il Barbire was brought out in 1816, La Sonambula in 1831, Lucia in 1835, Trovatore in 1853, and Verdi's last work in operatic style, Aida, in 1871. Don Giovanni still employs the dry recitative, recitatives accompanied by simple chords on violoncello, which is exceedingly tedious and makes the work drag at many points. In Il Barbire, although the recitatives are musically as uninteresting, 
They are humorous and, with Italian buffos, trip lightly and vivaciously from the tongue. As regards Fidelio and Der Freischütz, the amount of spoken dialogue in them is enough to keep these works off the American stage, or at least to prevent them from becoming popular here. Wagner has had far-reaching effect upon music in general, and even Italian opera, which of all art forms was least like his music dramas, has felt his influence. Boito's Mephistofele, Poncielli's La Gioconda, Verdi's Otello and Falstaff are examples of the far-reaching results of Wagner's theories. Even in Aida, Verdi's more discriminating treatment of the orchestral score and his successful effort to give genuine oriental color to at least some portions of it show that even then he was beginning to weary of the cheaper successes he had won with operas like Il Trovatore, La Traviata and Rigoletto and, while by no means inclined to menace his own originality by copying Wagner or by adopting his system, was willing to profit by the more serious attitude of Wagner towards his art. Puccini, in La Tosca, has written a first-act finale which is palpably constructed on Wagnerian lines. In his La Bohème, in Leon Cavallo's I Pagliacci, and in Mascani's Cavalleria Rusticana, the distinct efforts made to have the score reflect the characteristics of the text show Wagner's influence potent in the most modern faces of Italian opera. Humperdinck's Hänsel und Gretel and Richard Strauss' Feuersnot and Salome represent the further working out of Wagner's art form in Germany. Wagner's music dramas. I doubt whether Wagner had either the Greek drama or the declamatory recitative of the early Italian opera composers in mind when he originated the music drama. My opinion is that he thought it out free from any extraneous suggestion, but afterward, anticipating the attacks which in the dense state of music in Germany would be made upon his theories, sought for prototypes and found them in ancient Greece and renaissance Italy. His theory of dramatic music is that it should express with undeviating fidelity the words which underlie it, not words in their mere outward aspect, but their deeper significance in their relation to the persons, controlling ideas, impulses and passions out of which grow the scenes, situations, climaxes and crises of the written play, the libretto, if you so choose to call it, so long as you don't say, book of the opera. For even from this brief characterization, it must be patent that the music drama is not an opera, but what opera should be, or would be, had it not, through the Italian love of clearly defined melody and the Italian admiration for beautiful singing, become a string of solos, duets, and other numbers, written in set form to the detriment of the action. Opera is the glorification of the voice and the deification of the singer. Do we not call the prima donna a diva? Music drama, on the other hand, is the glorification of music in its broadest sense, instrumental and vocal combined, and the deification of dramatic truth on the musical stage. Opera, as handled by the Italian and the French, undoubtedly is a very attractive art form, but music drama is a higher art form because more serious and more searching and more elevated in its expression of emotion. Wagner was German to the core, as national as Luther, says Mr. Krebiel most aptly in his Studies in the Wagnerian Drama, which, like everything this critic writes, is the work of a thinker. For the dramas which Wagner created as the basis for his scores, he went back to legends which, if not always Teutonic in their origin, had become steeped in Germanism. The profound impression made by Wagner's artworks may be indicated by saying that the whole folklore movement dates from his activity, and that so far as Germany itself is concerned, his argument for a national artwork as well as his practical illustration of what he meant through his own music dramas 
gave immense impetus to the development of united Germany as manifested in the German Empire. He, as well as the men of blood and iron, had a share in Seda. Wagner's first successful work, Rinzi, was an out-and-out -out opera in Meyerbeerian style. The Flying Dutchman already is legendary and more serious, while Tannhäuser and Lohengrin show immense technical progress, besides giving a clue to his system of leading motives, which is fully developed in the scores of The Ring of the Nibelung, Tristan und die Solde, Die Meistersinger and Parsifal. That his theories met with a storm of opposition and that for many years the battle between Wagnerism and anti-Wagnerism raged with unabated vigor in the musical world are matters of history. Whoever wishes to explore this phase of Wagner's career will find it set forth in the most interesting Wagner biography in any language, Mr. Fink's Wagner and his works. Wagner, a melodist. It sometimes is contended that Wagner adopted his system of leading motives because he was not a melodist. This is refuted by the melodies that abound in his earlier works, and even as I write, I can hear the pupils in a nearby public school singing the melody of the Pilgrim's Chorus from Tannhäuser. Moreover, his leading motives themselves are descriptively or soulfully melodious as the requirement may be. They are brief phrases, it is true, but nonetheless they are melodies. And in certain episodes in his music dramas, when he deemed it permissible, he introduced beautiful melodies that are complete in themselves. Sigmund's love song and Wotan's farewell in Die Walküre, the love duet at the end of Siegfried, the love scene in Tristan und Isolde, the prize song in Die Meistersinger. The eloquence of the brief melodious phrases which we call leading motives, considered by themselves alone and without any reference to the dramatic situation, must be clear to anyone who has heard the funeral march in Götterdämmerung, which consists entirely of a series of leading motives that have occurred earlier in the cycle, yet give this passage an overpowering pathos, without equal in absolute music, and just as effective whether you know the story of the music drama and the significance of the motives or not. If you do know the story and the significance of these musical phrases, you will find that in this funeral march the whole ring of the Nibelung is being summoned up for you, and coming as it does near the end of Götterdämmerung, but one scene intervening between it and the final curtain, it gives a wonderful sense of unity to the whole work. Unity is, in fact, a distinguishing trait of music drama, and the very term unity suggests that certain recurring salient points in the drama, whether they be personages, ideas or situations, should be treated musically with a certain similarity and have certain recognizable characteristics. In fact, the adaptation of music to a drama would seem to suggest association of ideas through musical unity, and to presuppose the employment of something like leading motives. They had indeed been used tentatively by Berlioz in orchestral music and by Weber in opera, or Rianfe, but it remained for Wagner to work up the suggestion into a complete and consistent system. method, take the curse motive in the ring of the Nibelung, which is heard when Alberich curses the ring, and all into whose possession it shall come. When, near the end of Rheingold, Fafner kills his brother Fasold, in wresting the ring from him, the motive recurs with a significance which is readily understood. Fasold is the first victim of the curse. Again, in Götterdämmerung, when Siegfried lands at the entrance to the castle of Gibichungs and is greeted by Hagen, although the greeting seems hearty enough, the motive is heard and conveys its sinister lure.
when, in Die Walküre, Brünnhilde predicts the birth of a son to Sieglinde, you hear the Siegfried motif, signifying that the child will be none other than the young hero of the next drama. The motif is heard again when Wotan promises Brünnhilde to surround her with a circle of flames which none but a hero can penetrate. Siegfried being that hero, and also when Siegfried himself, in the music drama Siegfried, tells of seeing his image in the brook. There are motifs which are almost wholly rhythmical, like the Nibelung smithy motif, which depicts the slavery of the Nibelungs, eternally working in the mines of Nibelheim, and motifs with strange, weird harmonies, like the motif of the Tarnhelm, which conveys a sense of mystery, the Tarnhelm giving its wearer the power to change his form. Leading motifs, not mere labels. Leading motifs are not mere labels. They concern themselves with more than the superficial aspects of things and persons. With persons, they express character. With things, they symbolize what these stand for. The curse motif is weird, sinister. You feel when listening to it that it bodes evil to all who come within its dark circle. The Siegfried motif, on the other hand, is buoyant with youth, vigor, courage, vibrates with the love of achievement, and stirs the soul with its suggestion of heroism. But when you hear it in the funeral march in Götterdämmerung, and it recalls by association the gay-hearted, tender, yet courageous boy who slew the dragon, awakened Brünnhilde with his kiss, only to be betrayed and murdered by Hagen, and now is being borne over the mountain to the funeral pyre, those heroic strains have a tragic significance that almost brings tears to your eyes. The Siegfried motif is a good example of a musical phrase, the contour of which practically remains unchanged through the music drama. The varied emotions with which we listen to it are affected by association. But many of Wagner's leading motifs are extremely plastic and undergo many changes in illustrating the development of character or the special bearing of certain dramatic situations upon those concerned in the action of the drama. As a gay-hearted youth, Siegfried wins his horn. This horn call becomes when, as Brunhilde's husband, he bids farewell to his bride and departs in quest of knightly adventure, the stately motif of Siegfried, the hero. And when the dead Siegfried, stretched upon a rude bier, is born from the sea, it voices the climax of the tragedy with overwhelming power. Thus, we have two derivatives from the Siegfried horn call, each with its own special significance, yet harking back to the original germ. Soon after the opening of Tristan und Isolde, a sailor sings an unaccompanied song of farewell to his Irish maid. The words, the wind blows freshly toward our home, are sung to an undulating phrase which seems to represent the gentle heaving of the sea. This same phrase gracefully undulates through Brangene's reply to Isolde's question as to the vessel's course, changes entirely in character, and searches savagely around her wild outburst of anger when she is told that the vessel is nearing Cornwall's shore, and breaks itself in savage fury against her despairing wrath when she invokes the elements to destroy the ship and all upon it. Examples like this occur many times in the scores of Wagner's music dramas. Music 
Often when several characters are participating in a scene, or when the act or influence of one or the principle for which he stands in a drama is potent, though he himself is not present, Wagner with rare skill combines several motives, utilizing for this purpose all the resources of counterpoint. Elsewhere I already have described how he has done this in the magic fire scene in Die Walküre, and one could add page after page of examples of this kind. I have also spoken of his supreme mastership of instrumentation, through which he gives an endless variety of tone color to his score. Wagner was a great dramatist, but he was a far greater musician. There are many splendid scenes and climaxes in the dramas which he wrote for his music, and if he had not been a composer, it is possible he would have achieved immortality as a writer of tragedy. On the other hand, however, there are in his dramas many long stretches in which the action is unconsciously delayed by talk. He believed that music and drama should go hand in hand and each be of equal interest, but his supreme musicianship has disproved his own theories, for his dramas derived a breath of life from his music. Theoretically, he is not supposed to have written absolute music, music for its own sake, but music that would be intelligible and interesting only in connection with the drama to which it was set. But the scores of the great scenes in his music dramas, played simply as instrumental selections in concert, and without the slightest clue to their meaning in their given place, constitute the greatest achievements in absolute music that history up to the present time can show. End of chapter 16 End of How to Appreciate Music by Gustav Koppel